Jeez, it's great. Am I the only one? Oh. <laughs> I'm so thankful for what these guys shared. I'm gonna sit down today. Um, my ankle's not feeling too well. I have to have surgery next month. I think I mentioned briefly that I had a, a sort of career ending. At least that's what the doctors are saying right now, injury to my ankle. So I'm going to sit and I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to tell a story of what God did in my life. I'm so glad for these guys talking about God's love, God changing us, um, God being a friend too. Speaking of true friendship, I'm so glad Jesus is my friend. I'm so glad that he doesn't accuse, he doesn't condemn me, he, he just loves me. And he, he deals with me and he puts up with me and he's patient with me. And, and we do come alive in that river. When we, sing, when we sing, we come alive in the river, we come alive in the river of God's love. And that's just about the only place we'll come alive. Um, <clears throat> we won't come alive in, in shame. We won't come alive in guilt. We, we won't come alive in feeling like a victim. We will come alive in feeling the love of God in Jesus Christ and his perfect acceptance of us. And I, uh, I want us to open our Bibles to Psalm 107. If you have one, go to Psalm 107. We talked about God serving us yesterday and what that means and how he served us. Beyond just everyday life, he served us freedom, and he served us freedom in Christ, um, full acceptance. And he's serving us freedom now. If you feel a little more inclined toward Jesus than you did yesterday, it means the Holy Spirit's working. It means the Holy Spirit's ministering to you because the Holy Spirit's sort of like the tech guys back right there, just doing, doing his job silently, wanting you to see Christ, wanting you to see his son, why do you see his love for you? So it's behind the scenes, but if you feel a little more inclined to Christ this morning than you did last night, then praise God because the Spirit's working. And I believe it's happening. It's happening for me. Um, and it's happening in my story. Psalm 107 is, is, a, is a really cool psalm because it sort of gives five or six sample testimonies. Um, you probably, no matter where you're at in life, will be able to read these five or six paragraphs and say, oh, I'm sort of in that place. Either before God came and healed me and in the midst of my brokenness or after. And it's, it's so beautiful because when I read this psalm, I, I sort of related to multiple paragraphs. And the one that I think defines my story best. And the one that I'll use as an outline for my story, it starts in verse 17. So if you're with me, I'm gonna start reading at Psalm 107, verse 17. I'm reading from the ESV. Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them. He sent out his word and healed them. It's a one-time event. And delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds and songs of joy. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, thank you so much for this, this retreat. Thank you so much for the word of God, the word of life, and the word in flesh, Jesus Christ, who come for us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you also for good food, and thank you for dodgeball and people getting hit so hard and it's not really hurting them because that's a softball. It's just fun to watch, Lord. And there's no pain in the So we praise you for just great throws and hard hits. Um, thank you so much for fun and laughter and joy. You're not a God who just 
wants us to stay in a serious place all the time. But your freedom allows us to go have fun, to not think deeply, to play sports, to read, write, to, to sing, to dance, to do whatever our hearts desire and your will. And um, we praise you for that. Lord, we pray that whoever's cold in this room, Lord, you would heat them up. <laughs> we care about the details in our life, Lord. So we praise you and we lift, lift you up. Jesus be seen in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 17. Some were fools through their sinful ways. And because of their iniquities, they suffered affliction. I, um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I was born in Germany. I, I lived there until I was 12. And then my father, who's from Southern California, <clears throat> He, he said, I want to go home. It's too cold for me here. It's really, really cold. And I forget the sun even exists most of the time. So I want to go back to Cali, Cali. Let's go back. And so my family backed up everything. <laughs> and I was excited because um, I saw palm trees for the first time. <laughs> and I just thought I'd arrived in paradise. Um, but, but this verse, it, it calls people fools in their sinful ways. And, and when I think about a fool, it's not this sort of indictment like, hey, you're a fool. It's if you don't believe in God, you're a fool. If, if he who says in, in his heart there is no God, you're a fool. It, it's just more of a matter of fact. And we go in and out of this. We, we act out of just not believing in God every day. No matter how long you've been walking with the Lord, when you act like God isn't a reality, uh, you're a fool, is what, what, what this says. And, and it produces in you sinful ways. And so for me, I didn't grow up, when I showed up here in California, I didn't grow up with any kind of Christian background. I didn't grow up with God in my life. My father mentioned the Bible. He mentioned Christianity as if... If there's ever any religion, that's the one we, we adhere to. But I never knew about the word. And he never really, he gave me some moral guidelines, but he never taught me the ways of God. And so when I came over here, I didn't have any sort of identity to fall back on. I, I really, really wanted to fit in. And this is where you start seeing sinful ways being produced. Because I cared more about the reputation of man than anybody else. I could have cared more about, like Shay said, what others think of me than anything else. And I was 12 years old, and I showed up in California. I'm switching schools in the middle of the first trimester in seventh grade. And I'm like, Pops, I saw on TV that people in America wear Air Force Ones. So can we go get some Air Force Ones? And my dad's going, yes, yeah, so I'll get you some Air Force Ones. He got me some shoes that had the Nike swoosh sign on them. I'm thinking, okay, I'm cool now. Like, now I can go to school. So I'm wearing my shoes, and it wasn't until second period PE class that the kid, this kid named Zach Omar, who I go through high school with the rest of the way, he goes, hey, look at that guy. He's wearing dunks. And I guess that was m making fun of me, so they weren't Air Force Ones. I got dunks, and I was so mad at my father. So my first, my first hope to fit in totally failed. It, it was shattered. And, um... I'm so thankful for basketball because basketball for me became my fitting in. Sports is an amazing thing because you don't have to walk up to anyone and say, nice to meet you, my name is Andre. You have to be able to shoot a ball. And so I've been playing basketball for like a year and a half at that point and I made my friends in that circle. And I would go through my junior year of high school basically wanting to fit in but never really being able to. And I, I'm six foot six, Chris pointed out that I'm tall. It took me a while to grow into my body. I mean a long time. So so my from the day I got here in seventh grade to the end of my junior year in high school, my name among my peers was Goof. There goes Goof. And it was kind of like a lighthearted thing. I tried to twist it, like, yeah, I'm goof. But who, who wants to be goof, you know what I mean? <laughs> so here I am, my limbs are growing faster than my muscles, and I'm just sort of, does that make sense? My limbs are growing faster than my muscles. I was getting along, and my muscles weren't growing. Do you get it? I was goofy. And, and uh, 
The God of my life was wanting to fit in. I wanted to fit in so bad. I dreamt of the day a girl would think I was cute. Oh my goodness. I had a list. I had a list of people's names in my head. Not in the book. That's what it is. <laughs> in high school and I just knew I was never I was never gonna get there I just was never going to draw their attention I don't even know if they knew my name I mean Ashley King and Liz Rimland and oh, Carissa I just thought man, if there could just be one time you know I think they smiled at me once but that was about it so I never been to any high school dance I, I just I never Oh, yeah. And so that wasn't working out for me. The social life wasn't working out for me. I would go home, but and video games was my haven. I would play SOCOM like all night. You guys probably don't know what SOCOM is. It's like the original Call of Duty. And I would play all night. I got so good. I was ranked like 14 in all of the world. That's what I told people. And, and, and I played basketball. I love basketball. And then something happened in my summer going from junior year to senior year. Summer you get like three months off and people change in, in your guys' age quick. And so my dad and I talked and I said, hey, I want to play football this season. I already played two seasons, but I want to play basketball better than I ever had. I, I made the varsity team my junior year, but I, but I averaged one point a game. <laughs> so that was also not giving me much social status, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I was one point a game and I wanted to, I, I always believed that I could be the best. And so my dad said, all right, I want to be the best. I learned some things in the military from a football coach, I'll coach you. We're waking up 5 a.m. every morning, I'll have you up with a protein shake and we're gonna go lift. And so I'm like, all right. No matter what, I just want to achieve my goals, so I'll do it. Woke up every morning at 5 a.m. My dad took me to the gym and started lifting. I had braces until the end of my junior year, summer. Like that summer, I got my braces out. So I was later than that. I had it to the goof, you know what I mean? Goof was going good for me. And then, <laughs> and then I came back on campus, and I had my braces out, and I started seeing some biceps come in. And all of a sudden, these girls, those girls that I listed, I show up on campus, and one of their friends goes, hey, Ashley wants to know where you're going for, uh, for study. There's, a, there's like a period that we have where we can go study to study hall 30 minutes, and I'm like, Ashley, like that Ashley? <laughs> Tell her I'm going wherever she's going. <laughs> And then, fast forward, I, 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 got to, I got to my football coach and he said, wow, like you're going to be a great football player, you're going to get a scholarship. But then I got into the meeting with my basketball coach and he heard I was going to play football. Football is right before basketball season. It's a fall sport, basketball is a winter sport. He sits me down in his office and he goes, Andre, I heard you're going to play football. And, and I have a little bit of a concern because I was planning on building my whole entire team around you this season. I've seen how you played this summer, and you've drastically improved, and I've watched you, and I want to build my team around you. But I think it will present a problem if you play football right before basketball, because you won't be in the kind of shape you need to be in for me to build my team around you. This was happening right as I started getting popular in school. And I'm thinking, Oh, I made it. This is heaven. Like I have some coach telling me he's going to build his team around me. I have people playing along with, man, you're sort of the center of attention. And then I go into my basketball season. I decided to do what he says. I average 20 points a game. I get an all-county second team. I get all these accolades. The Orange County Register plays, plays along and, and starts writing articles about me. And I'm thinking, I arrived at the kingdom of heaven. And I, 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 I got a girlfriend that, that year. And, 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 and,
when I had a girlfriend that year who she uh, she took me to winter formal the year before. So in my goof stage, in the age of goof, she asked me to winter formal. And she had to ask because winter formal was the girls ask guys. And she asked me and I and I started waiting for her after every class to walk her to the next class. And I I went, I, I was hoping that I could uh, hang out with her after after school a little bit. So I started I met her at her locker. And about three weeks later, the, like this is still junior year, she goes, Hey, uh, <laughs> you're great. The dance, it was great, but I think we should stop hanging out. And it crushed my heart. So mad. So fast forward, back in senior, things are starting to happen. I got a date with this girl named Kelly Jack, and she was like the trophy date. And I'm, you should, nobody should be a trophy date. That's not their identity. But, but for me, that's, that's what it was. And, and all the guys were like, how's Andre now on a date with Kelly Jack? And my, that girl heard about it, and she, she came and said, um, she, she called me crying. And she said, hey, I made a lot of mistakes these last seven months. And um, I really want you to be with me. I just really want you to be with me. And then, seven months, we were thinking, and I couldn't say no. So I got into that relationship. Social life. I had this God in my life. This, this foolish God in my life was now starting to work for me. But very, very, very quickly, I became so full of myself. I became so self-centered, and I knew enough from being heckled and bullied to not ever bully or heckle anyone else. So I knew enough to be kind to people. But, but I, I still thought this world around Andre. Me at the center of attention is what I want to live for the rest of my life. That's where I want to live. I started going out, messing around, hanging out with other girls while I'm in this relationship. Started thinking that I have all kinds of, yes, no, you go, come with the shame. Anyways, no, I, I, I became so full of myself, and I, I, I just lived this life of Andre at the center of it all. Andre be the center of it all. And then I, I almost seemingly had no consequences. I went through that year, and I was liked, and I was accepted, and I was approved of, and I, I started getting phone calls for, for, from coaches, college coaches, NCAA coaches saying, hey, we would like to offer you a scholarship to our school. And I'm thinking, man, let's have a scholarship party for Andre. And, and people were hyping me up, man. And I, I, I grew this big, big head. Not, not, not my head now, I know it's big, but <laughs> figuratively speaking, like I was full of myself. And, Seemingly without consequences. I was 20 points a game. I got a scholarship offer that I accepted to an NAIA school, Concordia University in Irvine. And I chose that school, not an NCAA school, because I wanted to play right away. I wanted the world to revolve around Andre. And, and it was a school that said, if you come here, you'll play right away. Hey, come on your recruiting visit. I came on a recruiting visit. And it was in Irvine. Kobe Bryant lived in Costa Mesa. I played with Kobe Pickup. So that was like about the best sell for me. I'm coming here. This is my school. And I get there, and I'm still thinking it's all about Andre. I'm a freshman now. And I want to, I want to fit in. That's still what I want to do. I want to be accepted in life. And I run, to, I run into my teammates. And, uh, and these new seniors, right, people I look up to, people that are 24 years old, 23, and I'm 18 and I'm coming in and, and I can play basketball with these guys, but I have ways to go. Um, they start seeing that, you know, new guy on the block, 
let's see what he's about. And some of these guys, I realized, had really, really rough backgrounds. Really rough backgrounds. Um, neglected by parents, abandoned. And uh, this school, this NAI school, had, had less rules and restrictions than an NCAA school. So some of these guys were top level talent potential NBA players, some of them that are playing professionally, making tons of money right now, playing basketball still. And these guys um, couldn't keep the rules at these schools. So they come here with their rough backgrounds, and they, <clears throat> they said, you want to fit in with us, you're going to have to prove yourself by letting us know that you're down for us. And what that meant was, if there's ever any trouble when we go out and party, if you don't get in fights for us, you're not one of us. We have our back here. We're like a wolf pack, and if anybody threatens us, we fight. As we have beef with the baseball guys. We're, we're standing up for each other. And I come in like, I'm from OC, California. <laughs> Lake Forest. Second safest city in the entire United States. I can fight. Like, I can fight. I'm six foot six. I'm built for this. And so I go, and I want to fit in. This is my foolishness. Some were fools through their sinful ways. And, and because of their iniquities, they suffered much affliction. So I go here, and I still don't suffer all that much affliction, to be honest. I go to my first party, and I was never really into partying or drugs or alcohol, because I thought if I drank, I would immediately ruin my basketball career. So that's, that's just the way I thought. But that sort of kept me out of that. And then I, I, got, I, went to fight, I went to fight people at these parties. And I, I, I was nervous, I was scared, but I couldn't show. Because these guys that I wanted to fit in with, they were fighters. I had to prove myself to them. That's what was most important in my life, fitting in, caring about what other people think, like Shay said. And I'm sitting there getting into fights, harming other human beings. And I thought at the time, thankfully, I'm not getting harmed. And I was living like a Fool, like a complete fool. And it was only a matter of time until I'd suffer, suffer the fruit of that. But my dad, my dad was a, my dad was a, an amazing, he, he is, he was, he is an amazing father. My dad, he did grow up in uh, inner city Los Angeles. He um, had a psychotic mother who would wake him up with a knife in his throat because of her schizophrenia. He had a father that left him when he was three. He was a bastard child. He was a, a pro product of, of infidelity. So the, the father never, never, never was there for him. Um, and he fought and fought. And he had a rough background. And he didn't know enough about parenting from his dad, so he did, he's done with me the best that he could, but he promised himself he would never leave his children. He would never do what his father did, and he broke the generational gap. And I, I love my dad. But my dad, like I said, he grew up around the edges. He has a lot of colorful words, and the guys are raised a lot in his life, but when I was growing up, he would tell me the stories of fighting people. If anybody even laughed at me, I'd fight him. I'd get kicked out of school. And I'd go to the next school, and finally he got saved by the military, essentially, just to survive. And then, um, and, and then married my mother in, in Germany, and that story goes, goes on and on. But the point is, he had a lot of advice about fighting <laughs> to me. So, and, and when a kid hears about his father's background, he kinda, he's your hero, right? So i never really been in fights, but, but he's my hero, and my dad fought, so I'm kind of my dad, you know, like it's my DNA. And so I can fight. And uh, he told me, son, I hope you don't ever get to fight. But if you do, if you do have to, don't ever say, I'm going to meet you after class. Don't ever say, I'm going to meet you outside. Punch first. Because 85% 85, 85 of the people that punch first win the fight. And I was scared out of my mind getting in these fights with these teammates. Don't ever adopt my father's wisdom on that. But, but I was in this year of, of wanting to fit in, and I would go to these parties, and I wouldn't just look for fights, but if people were kind of bullying and eye eyeballing people, or the baseball guys started having beef with the basketball guys, I would just run in and punch. <laughs> and then and it happened about four times that year, and, and I, 
And I got away with it seemingly. I had a couple bumps on my head, but I got away with it. And I started to gain his reputation like, he's down for us. He's down for us. He's a friend to us. I had to work to be their friend. And some of those guys to this day I love and we're friends. And some, I see them come to Jesus and they're seeing my testimony. But, but at the time, that was what defined friendship. Social acceptance. And I want to go to verse 18. It says, they loathe any kind of food. Uh, just to let you know, throughout that time that I've been here in America, there's been multiple <coughs> seed planting going on in my heart. So all that time. All that time where it's, a, it's around Andre. The world revolves around Andre. There's a bunch of seed planters. Faithful people. Not always the best ways, but faithful people. So I went to the Harvest Crusade, for instance, when I was 16. And... Uh, I heard heaven's better than hell. I'm not saying that's, that, that's what was preached, but I heard that. I heard Jesus offers heaven, and I heard I can go play Barry Bonds in the outfield. I'm in. So I walked down to the field. I'm like, I'm a player. This is awesome. People pray for me, give me a Bible, and I'm thinking, cool. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I got a Bible free book. I got prayer, and I know what it's like to stand on the professional baseball field. And then I had a guy share uh, Jesus with me at Irvine Spectrum. And, and, and I said, dude, you're an idiot. Like, Jesus is not the only way. I'm not messed up. Thank you very much. Goodbye. But God's planting seeds. He's planting seeds for these faithful people. I loathe any kind of food. I loathed it. I hated it. I, don't, I didn't want anything to do with it. I had a friend who I, I praise God for, one of my dearest friends to this day. From high school, that senior year, all the way to to, um, to my fresh, freshman year in Irvine, Concordia University. She would invite me to Saddleback Church, Crave College Ministry, high school college ministry, and, and she's just faithful. Want to know what it's like to be a minister of the gospel? Hey, you want to come to church this week? Nah, going to a party. Okay, love you. Hey, you want to come to church this week? Really hungover. Love you. Hey, you want to come to church this week? Yeah. Actually, ah, got a date. Sorry. Hey, you want to come to church this week? Just faithful. Uh -huh. For that whole year. Faithful, faithful, faithful. I love it. And sometimes I would go to church. I would hear the word. And maybe you're here right now. And you're hearing everything that's going on. It's not really hitting you. But I would hear about this Jesus who offers life, who offers peace, who offers joy, who offers a new beginning, who offers grace for the broken, who actually only, accept the, only accepts the messed up ones. He's a physician who came to heal the sick. He didn't come for the healthy. He didn't come to wash the clean. He came to wash the dirty. And I'm like, good stuff. Cool. But I didn't really want it. I hated any kind of food. But Concordia University came up. I'm like, oh, it's a Lutheran school. I don't know. Isn't that Christian? Yeah. Okay, cool. That, maybe that could help my faith. They loathed any kind of food, and then they drew near to the gates of death. Um, I told you there was a year and a half of my life that, from senior year to to the end of my freshman year, that my life, my, my gaining reputation and fitting in socially, didn't seem to have any lasting effects negatively. Didn't seem to do me all that bad. I would hear about Jesus, even I think joy is cool, but I got a lot of I got a lot of joy. I like my my drinking nights with my friends. I like my basketball games and people praising, and applauding me. I like the relationship that I still have, by the way, from that from that senior year. Um, I, I get a lot of joy out of going way beyond boundaries with her and, and getting 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 intimate in a way that nobody ever should have, and in ways that I still reap consequences from today because I didn't listen to God because I was a fool in my simple ways. Um, but, but then there came consequences. Sin can be fun for a season. Sin can taste good for a season. The devil will dress himself up as an angel of light for a season. But then there come consequences. And then they drew near to the gates of death. And from April 2009 until summer 2010, when I became a believer, I endured the darkest days in my life. 
And it started like this. April 2009, my friends say, hey, there's a party in Irvine. We should all go. Teammates, my guys, I'll be there. I'm one of the first guys there. We have a couple beers. And um, I'm hanging out with the boys, you know, loving life. People love them. People love them. This is good. And then I go and, um, and, and I'm, I'm looking at the crowd that's following me. All Concordia people, all Concordia people. I'm thinking, oh, this is our, these are our people. We've already had a year of establishing that we're friends and everybody's cool with everyone. And it uh, looks like it won't be a troublesome night. Looks like I won't have to get in a fight of any kind today. Um, everyone's having fun, getting drunk. But I only had two beers before I saw a group of guys at this party, a, a kitchen and living room area packed with people. And, and I, <clears throat> I, I saw this guy surrounded by his four friends and he started staring at everyone, sort of just me mugging people. And my, my best friend to this day, but my best friend at the time, who was with me, a fool in our sinful ways, he, would, he was standing next to me and he knew that rule that I kept about if there's ever a threatening situation. And I told him, I said, hey, if this guy looks at me, I'm not gonna look away. And my ignorance and pride, and my alpha dog mentality, because it's so important to fit in, I will not look away from this guy if he thinks he wants to challenge me. And he, he goes from guy to guy, and he eventually looks at me, boom, lock eyes. After a while, it's about 15 seconds, kind of gets awkward when another male, he's looking at another male, <laughs> dead in the eyes. So, so it's kind of getting awkward, and I'm like, bro, are you good? <laughs> and he does this, he does this, he, he does this, he goes, he has long sleeves, he goes, licks his lips like that. Are you good? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I look at my lips, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> He, I look at him and I, and I say, and I look at my friend and I'm like, I'm like, Russian, I'm just gonna punch him. He goes, wait, just wait. And, and, and he still to this day doesn't know why he said that. But, <clears throat> but I, I think God placed those words on his lips because something that was gonna happen, change my life for the worse initially, but something that was about to happen will change my life forever. And I, 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 for the first time in my life, I agree to meet someone outside. Now everyone else is involved. My reputation's on the line. Everybody's seeing this interaction. These two idiots with their egos standing there. And who's going to back down first? And, and I'm closest to the door. So the first time in my life, I'm like, all right, this is this what you want to do? You want to get a fight? You want to get a fist fight? He goes, whatever, bro, let's do it. <laughs> and I walk out of I'm closest to the door. It's a big scene. Fight! Everybody, fight! And so everyone's following up the words. I'm waiting, and what I'm about to tell you happens in a split second. I'm waiting outside. He sprints at me with one hand behind his back. He gra I, grab him. I grab him. He grabs my shirt. We trip over the bushes. I lay on the floor, and in a moment, I'm trying to get control of him. I grab his legs. I try to work my way up his legs, and he's sitting up. He's sitting up, like, picture the ground behind me, sitting up, and he starts hitting me in my chest, hitting me, bow, bow. And I'm, what is he doing? That's not hurting me. Bah, bah, bah. And something happened. Something happened and changed everything because my whole body went numb. I still get goosebumps to this day. My whole body went numb. I rolled off of his back. I started feeling something in my breath that was like limited or catching and blocking. And I'm laying there. I have a black hooded sweater on. People are watching this and they're like, did you get knocked out? What's going on? And I'm, and, and I'm sitting there and I'm looking at my friends. My eyes get wide because I, I can't feel the sensation in my muscles. And I'm laying there and, and, and I heard that this guy, he was whispering with his friends and he sprinted off. There was a car waiting for him. So there was a door open for him. He just jumped in the car. They were gone. And, and meanwhile, back to me, I'm laying on the ground and I just start pointing at my chest, pointing at my chest. And my, my buddy, TJ, he comes up to me and goes, what's, what's wrong? And I'm like, and I, I realize I can't really talk. I'm like gasping. I'm like, uh, uh. And, and he, he looks at me and he lifts up my sweater and, 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 and screams happen. People start screaming and crying 
and saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And I got stabbed in my chest. And he lifts the sweater and there's blood gushing and I'm sitting there and people's panic makes me panic and I can't breathe and I'm laying on the lawn and I'm, I'm thinking, what? What's happening? I'm 19 years old. I'm 19. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I remember like it was yesterday. I don't want to die. And people are screaming. Teacher puts his hands down. And he holds my chest. And, and I can go on and on, but time fails us. And I, I end up in the hospital. And by the grace of God, the knife was three and a half inches long. I was lifting hard that year. I'm six foot six. God made me goofy and big and large. And in his sovereignty, he made me lift that, that year for reasons to want to be tough. He redeems the stupidity in us. And I did maybe an inch added to my chest muscle and the blade, three and a half inches, it collapses my lung, but it scratches my heart. And it's a millimeter away from my heart. And the doctor said, I was gonna do open heart surgery, you wouldn't have made it. I scratched your heart if it was any of your friends. If you weren't in the fitness that you're in right now, you would have died. And I don't know how to explain it to you, but you're a lucky kid, man. And because of their foolish ways, they drew near to the gates of death. I was in critical condition for two weeks. I had four or five surgeries and pneumonia that put me back into critical condition. I, I weighed 250 pounds at the time. I was 245. I lost 48 pounds. I was 197. And I had to learn how to walk again. I had to learn how to breathe again. But God, give God a shout of praise because seven months later, I was on basketball. And I would love to say, I would love to tell you guys, God became my treasure. Jesus became the Lord of my life. And the rest of my days, here I stand. I want to live for God. Yeah, I struggle, but I surrendered my life to him. False. And I'm going to have to go quickly in this. But the next year and a half was the darkest time in my life. People were giving me sympathy cards, compassion. People that pursued me in the church were visiting my hospital bed. And then I, start, I went back home and I, I, I saw everyone crying. My, my parents, I saw them cry. I heard the doctor tell them he's, he might die. And I saw my mom bleed. I saw picture frames from my basketball seasons and I looked at them and I said, this guy, whoever he is, he almost took a son away from his mother. Uh, uh, he almost took his son away from the father. And and I hate him. God, why would you allow this? All these guys are giving me sympathy and compassion because they know how bad it is what I went through. You know what? If you were real God, you would never let that happen. And I went back to school and I said, I'm an atheist. I was always social. I put my headphones in, I wore my hood, I walked around, and, and I, I'll tell you one thing that would destroy your life quicker than others, that the devil just loves, is a victim mentality. Mm -hmm. And boy, will you be able to justify whatever the heck you want if you're a victim. And I became more of a fool and I suffered more because of my sinful ways. I went to the psychiatrist, I would tell them stories, I would make up nightmares because I would want them to feel sorry for me. I still craved attention, I still craved love. She diagnosed me with post-traumatic stress disorder. I was on my dad's insurance, I went to the pharmacy. I could get any pill I wanted. I got antidepressants, I got prescription medication, I got anxiety medication, and it prescribed half a pill, and I started figuring out that if you take five, you feel better. So I would take five, and I would start hanging out and doing drugs I'd never done before, and I, and I realized if you crunch up the drugs and you snort them, it, it hits you faster. 
And I would go and hang out with my druggy friends, which really became my only friends with my teammates. And I would just snort whatever's on the table. And then I realized that these drugs, they actually give me street value. They have street value. I can sell them. I can make money. Money is a good thing. So I start selling them. And I'm, I'm a drug dealer on my campus now. People know where to go for marijuana, for drugs, for anything you want. Andre will get it. And I, could, I, I, got, I, I got started into trading drugs, and I had just ounces and ounces of different things in my room, and I was living crazy. I was starting to steal things. I, I would break into the cafeteria and steal a bag of Cheetos in the middle of the night because I was the victim. I'm the kid who got stabbed. Nobody understands. And I justified it. And I made it bigger than it even was. I never talked about my stuff. You know why? Because I knew if it's something I never talked about and I buried deep inside, people know it affects a lot. People know it's a big deal. Don't address that. Started doing drugs. People started hearing the rumors of me doing drugs on campus. God ain't real. That girlfriend that I had from my, from my junior year, from my senior year, I started... Chewing her out. I'd call her names, names I don't even want to repeat. Tell her she's never been through blank. I looked at other people's objects. If I was in that place sitting in front of you now, all of you guys would have just been objects to me. I was a dark person. And I eventually lost my basketball, got expelled from the school on a disciplinary note. They didn't have hard evidence on any of the drug stuff, but everybody kind of knew. They felt sorry for me, yes, because not a lot of people have been stabbed, so you, you got to be tender with it. So they, I, I took advantage of that tenderness all the time. And, um, and I, 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 I drew even more close to the gates of death because I got kicked out of school. And I'll wrap it up like this. The girlfriend that I had was home for the summer, she had to go work. Because her parents better get a summer job, they better be responsible, kid should. And uh, I said, you should be here for me. You're going to Nordstrom to work? Are you kidding me? Why do you need work? I'm hurting. I got her even to do drugs with me once. I destroyed people's lives, guys. I destroyed people's lives. And I was so miserable and hated myself that it delighted me to, to harm others and see others in pain. But then I got kicked out. That relationship ended. She left me, and I found out that she had been violated in an unspeakable way, but she couldn't tell me because it was too much for me to handle. And for the first time, I started thinking about someone else's welfare, but mine in a year and a half. But I, I, something so terrible happened to her that I went to do my drugs and I, I had a hallucination and a trip and I saw this image of people violating her more vividly than I ever had before. The devil and sinful habits, they'll, they'll comfort you for a while, but he'll show his face to you eventually. And those drugs basically took me in and reeled me in for a year and a half. And then I had this trip where I almost took my life and it spit me out and I wanted nothing more to do with these pills. And this girl left. She left. She said, I can't be with you anymore. I'm sorry for everything you've been through, but I can't be with you anymore. I remember I was in my room, summer of 2010, and I, and I was like, I hadn't eaten for three days. I hadn't slept in three days. And I hadn't stopped weeping in three days because I had nothing left. And I've been in church, and I've heard them tell me, surrender your life to God, He can give you a new beginning. But I said, I have my own things in my life, and it's not, I don't want it. But God did chemotherapy on me. You know what chemotherapy is? It's when someone has cancer, and they have a cancerous cell to death sentence in their body. They do what's called chemotherapy, and they kill them. All the good things, all the good cells in your body, so that everything will be killed, that's bad. And God removed basketball, a great
great girl, my scholarship, my future, my hope in anything earthly. He killed it. He killed it. And I sat there, and I, for the first time, felt like there was no light at the end of the tunnel. It's the scariest feeling I've ever felt in my life. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. I saw 50 prescription pills still on my desk, and I grabbed them, and I said, I'm done. I'm dying, and there's no ambulance coming this time. Thank you. 